Good morning and welcome to the service at Zion Baptist Church Bedworth. We are going to open our Bibles this morning in the Gospel of John and chapter 19, so the 19th chapter of John's Gospel and we're going to read from verse 17 to verse 31. So John's Gospel chapter 19 commencing to read at verse 17. And he, that is Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the centre. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this title, but the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Well, our men will leave the reading there, and before we come to consider something of that passage, we will uh, just come to... God and ask his blessing upon us. Let's pray. Great and mighty loving Lord God, we thank you once again for the privilege and the opportunity of gathering to consider your word. We thank you, dear Lord, once again that we can open the Bible and read of the great work of salvation that your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has accomplished. We thank you, dear Lord, that these things are written for our encouragement and our blessing and we pray this morning that as we consider something of this passage that you would be pleased to bless and encourage and comfort us each dear lord if there are any listening who remain strangers to the grace of the lord jesus christ who do not know that their sins have been forgiven and we pray that even this morning you may open their hearts and show them their need of a savior and we ask for those of us who have heard the voice of Christ and been called into his kingdom, that we may find comfort and confidence as we consider his words this morning. We ask these things in his name, for his honour and for his glory. Amen. Well, today I would like us to consider the subject of Christian comfort and Christian confidence of why it is that Christians can have peace and joy in the difficulties and the struggles of life. Why it is 
that Christians can look forward with hope and confidence to the future without fear. We're very simply today going to remind ourselves of the reason for the comfort and the confidence that believers have. And of course that is found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are a Christian this morning, then I do pray that as we consider again the Lord Jesus Christ and the words that he spoke and the, the meaning that uh, is attached to them, that you will be encouraged and you will be comforted, that you will be reminded of what he has done for you and of the promises that he's made to you. If you're not a Christian this morning, and as we look at these things and as we consider the great comfort and the great confidence that those who know Christ have, as we look at his glory and his person, then I trust you'll be honest enough to ask yourself, what is it that is giving you comfort? And where are you placing your confidence? And is that confidence and that comfort in any way comparable to that which Christ gives? Well, this morning we're going to consider these things as we look at three uh, words that Christ spoke in this passage, and then this evening we're going to look at three further words that Christ speaks, and in both cases we're going to consider the, the comfort and the confidence that we can get if we know Christ from these words. And this morning we're going to look at those very well-known and very loved words that are found in verse 30 where we read, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. One of those great statements of Christ from the cross. And as we hear these words uttered by Christ there, just before he lays down his life, we can take comfort and confidence that Christ's words are confirmed. Throughout the three years of his public ministry, leading up to this moment, Jesus Christ had been declaring time and again that the purpose for his coming into this world was to suffer and to die. In Mark chapter 10, he declares that he has come to give his life as a ransom for many, to pay a debt on behalf of others, to free them. And these words, it is finished, they declare that debt had been paid. In John chapter 10, he declares that he has the power to lay down his life, that it cannot be taken from him. And these words, it is finished immediately precede the statement that confirms the truth of what it is he had said there. He gave up his spirit. Time and again, throughout the gospel narratives, we have occasions where he warns his disciples that he will be taken, that he will be crucified by those who hate him. Every word of prophecy and every promise that Christ made concerning his death, its manner, its timing, its reason, its circumstances, they are all fulfilled when these words are uttered. It is finished. Every one of them, every prophecy given throughout the Old Testament, hundreds of years prior, that pointed to the coming Messiah and his suffering and death. We read of some of them in this passage in verse 24 where we're reminded that the scripture was fulfilled as they cast lots for his garments. And in verse 28 we're told that Christ knew that all things had now been accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And when he utters these words, it is finished. Everything that had been declared and everything that had been prophesied had come to pass. There is a reminder for us here in these words it is finished. 
that when a word has been spoken by Christ, it is a word that can be relied upon. It is a word that has been spoken in truth. It is a word that must come to pass. Jesus himself says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And here, as he utters these words, it is finished. We see the truth of that statement. Everything that had been said and everything that had been uh, pointed to had taken place. Every word that Christ has ever spoken and every promise he has ever made will all, without fail, end when he utters the words it is finished. Every promise will come to pass. What he has determined and what he has said he will do. And this morning, if you are a Christian, you may find yourself let down and disappointed by your brethren, by your church leaders, by your spouse or your family and your friends and your employer. Even disappointed and let down by yourself. But Jesus Christ will never fail in anything that he has said. Here on the cross at Calvary, he proves the reliability and the truth of his words. And as a result, we can have confidence and take comfort that nothing that he has declared will ever be left undone. Nothing that he has said will ever be revoked or changed. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. The words of encouragement and the promises that he has blessed his people with are more sure and more certain than the ground upon which we walk. The earth may indeed be shaken and dissolved, but his words will endure. The words and the promises of Christ end when they are fully and finally completed. And these words, it is finished, give comfort that that is the case. Read his words, meditate upon them. Praise him for them and be assured of the certainty of them. If you're not a Christian this morning, what words and what promises can you build your life upon? How often we are let down and disappointed. How often it is we fail and others fail us. There's no comfort and no confidence outside of Jesus Christ. He alone has proved and demonstrated and confirmed that his words are true. Hear him. It is finished. Christ's word confirmed. It is finished. Christ's people delivered. Here with these three simple words, the work of salvation and redemption is completed. And for those for whom Christ came, they are delivered from the penalty of their sins. All of them. Nothing is left to do. That is the meaning of these words, it is finished. There is nothing left to pay. There is nothing left for us. He has done it all. He has secured it all. He has paid it all. He has suffered it all. To the extent that John in his first letter could write, the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin, such that we can sing if we know he has suffered in our place 
complete atonement you have made and to the utmost farthing paid whatever your people owed how then can wrath on me take place if sheltered in your righteousness and sprinkled with your blood with these three small words Jesus Christ has confirmed the church's deliverance from the demands of divine justice and the hand of an offended God. If he has delivered you from this, then what have you to fear? Who can stand against you and accuse you? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, Paul writes to the church at Rome. Christian friends, we all fail. We all continue to fall short. We all still engage at times willingly and enthusiastically in sin. And yet, when Jesus Christ brings us to our senses, and we repent of those sins and those failings, he is faithful and just to forgive us those sins because of these words that he uttered here on the cross. It is finished. These words are not a license to sin, but they provide a confidence and a comfort that when we do, that we can go again to him, that we can return and seek his mercy, knowing that he will receive us and he will welcome us. We are those who can come boldly to the throne of grace. If this morning you do not have the comfort and the confidence that Jesus Christ died for you, and that he paid for your sins there upon that cross. Then where are you placing your hope? You know that you cannot live forever. You know that there is a day appointed for you to die. Your life must one day end with those words, it is finished. And then comes the judgment. You may live denying it. You may live not believing it. You may make for yourself a God that will accept you. You may hope that the God of the Bible is not as he has declared himself to be a God of justice. But whatever it is that you hold on to, and whatever it is, That you place your confidence in. It is at best a blind hope. It is at best a weak comfort. A hope that may give some excuse in life. But will provide no comfort in death. And as we sadly are witnessing at the moment... That time may be closer for many of us than we think. People today, they're not fearing coronavirus. They fear what it might lead to, death. Why do so many people, and so many, why are so many people fearful? Because they're not ready. Are you ready this morning? Are you ready and confident that you can face death and the judgment that must follow? You cannot face it with confidence and with a certain hope without Christ. But with Christ and in Christ, because of these words that were said here, it is finished. There is no fear in death. For those to whom Christ 
has spoken these words. It is finished. Christ's words confirmed. Christ's people delivered. Christ's love demonstrated. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ is without doubt the greatest demonstration of love that this world will ever know or ever see. We have here, as we read these words in John, none other than God the Son, the creator of all things, the glorious, eternal God, coming in human flesh, taking the role of a servant and humbling himself to the point of death and enduring all that suffering on behalf of a people that he loves to ensure that they are found in his presence. These words, it is finished, they are a demonstration of the depth of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. They confirm to us that he stayed the course, that he remained on the cross until the last sin of the last saint had been fully discharged. None of his people were abandoned on the cross. The suffering was not too great, that he did not consider it worthwhile. None of his people were considered too insignificant. None of them were considered too weak or too pathetic or too sinful or too useless to be abandoned and left. But no, he went and he stayed because his love is so great for every single one of them. Every one of them, the including you this morning, if you have experienced his love in the forgiveness of your sins, is, as Peter tells us, chosen by God and precious. If you are a Christian this morning, Christ loves you. If you are a Christian this morning, you are precious to him. If you are a Christian this morning, Christ desires your presence and wants your person. That was the prayer of Jesus before he went to the cross. I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. What greater demonstration of love could God give to you, Christian friend, this morning than here on the cross? What confidence and what comforts you can have in the love of Jesus Christ towards you because of these three words, it is finished. His love for you would not allow him to leave the cross until he could say in respect of you and your sins, it is finished. This is a personal statement. It is a personal statement of love to each and to every believer. He has spoken it for the benefit of every one of us, individually and personally. He is saying, in effect, the work I have come to do for you, whoever you are, it is finished. A love that will not let you go in the depths of the sufferings of Calvary is a love that you can take comfort in, a love that you can be confident will remain upon you and will hold you through whatever the trials and sorrows that he will bring you into and that he will carry you through and bring you out of. We have that wonderful picture for us in Isaiah 43 where God says, Fear not, 
for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And he goes on in that chapter to say, since you were precious in my sight, you have been honoured, and I have loved you. Here is confidence and here is comfort for those who know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is love summed up in those words. Fear not, fear not, for it is finished. Christ's words confirm. Christ's people delivered. Christ's love demonstrated and Christ's enemies defeated. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus declares to his enemies as they come to arrest him, this is your hour and the power of darkness. And having strived to silence and to destroy him, with these words, it is finished. Jesus Christ announces the end of their hour. Their schemes have been shattered and their hopes lie in ruins as the King of Kings completes the great work of salvation and confirms his authority over all. In just a few days, he will rise gloriously from the grave and his fame and his gospel will spread across the world, sweeping aside those who stand in its path. We see the extent of their defeat today, as in every corner of the globe, the name of Jesus Christ is praised and is honoured. We see the extent of their defeat today as sinners from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation are drawn by the grace of God to the Lord Jesus Christ in confession of sin and in faith. Christian, there is nothing and no one that can stand and prosper against him. He determines all things, and every encounter, and every circumstance, every blessing and trial, every joy and pain, every delight and sorrow, are held by him. Whatever you have to face, you can do so with confidence that Christ is on the throne. You can do so in the comfort of knowing that he reigns without a rival, that your enemies are his enemies, and as they failed to destroy him, they cannot ultimately destroy you or your faith. John writes of the confidence that believers can have and the comfort that they have in his first letter when he states the change that Jesus Christ has effected in his people. You are of God, little children, he writes, brought by Christ into the family of God through the work of the Holy Spirit who abides and dwells in each and every member of that family. So that John can go on to write, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
What comfort and what confidence we can have as we read these words of Jesus Christ. It is finished. Any possibility of any of those for whom he died ever being found held captive by those who stand against him has ended. Their time had come and their time had gone and they had failed to achieve anything other than confirming their own condemnation and foolishness. This morning, each of us stand either with Christ or against Christ. He who is not with me is against me, Jesus said, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. This morning, have you been called by Christ into his kingdom? Has he healed in you a heart broken by guilt and shame over sin? Has he spoken words of peace and forgiveness to you? If you cannot look back over your life and say yes to these things, then you remain against him. You remain one who scatters. You remain an enemy of Christ and his church. You remain a slave to sin and a servant of Satan. Do not be complacent in the matters of your soul and your eternal welfare. Examine and consider your interaction not your interaction with the church, not your interaction with the church's activities, not your interaction with the church's members, but your interaction with the church's head, Jesus Christ himself. Are you with him? Here is the great comfort, and the great confidence of those who are his, because he stands with his people. He is the victor who has vanquished every foe, including death, and him who has the power of death. That is the devil. The power of Satan and the power of death were stripped bare and exposed in all their weakness as Jesus cried out, it is finished. These are the words, Christian friend, that can carry you through the hardest of battles and the toughest of times. These are the words that will bring hope and comfort and peace because they are words that confirm that you cannot lose your salvation, that you cannot be snatched out of his kingdom, that you cannot be removed from his presence, that you cannot cease to be loved by him. What confidence and what comfort the Christian can draw from this great statement of the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross at Calvary. It is a declaration that confirms Christ's word, that delivers Christ's people, that demonstrates Christ's love and defeats Christ's enemies. It is finished. Amen. Let's pray. Great and loving Lord God, we do indeed thank you for that great statement of the Lord Jesus Christ there on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for all that it means and for all that he had accomplished. We thank you that through it and in it and through him and in him, those who are found in his kingdom can have great confidence and comfort in these words. May they be words that comfort us each and that we ourselves can say, yes, he died for me and spoke these words on my behalf. We pray this will be the case for us each, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.